Hey, this is Brian O'Connell with Live Nation, and we are on Promoter 101. Well, we are back, and all new this week on Promoter 101. With special guest host Ant Taylor. Welcome back to the podcast, buddy. Thanks, man. Good to be here. So we got the goods this week with UTA's Jeremy Holgerson, talking g Easy to the Pogues. And we have a fresh war story with legendary runner Aaron Falls. Hey, it's Brian Penix with NS2 and ABI Management. I'm going to be on Promoter 101. We're changing it up a little bit this week. That's right. We'll post two shows a week starting today and Thursday at 5 p.m. PST. The shows will be a condensed version of Promoter 101, but we'll bring them to you twice as often. PST, of course, is Pacific Standard Time for those of you not in the know. That's 8 o'clock on the coast. And then, you know, in Europe, it's like later. Anyway, they're bite-sized portions fit for your perfect commute size and hope that makes it a little easier for you and maybe a little easier for us, actually, because let's just face it, we're just trying to make life easier on ourselves. The rumors are true. The podcast is just everywhere. You know? It is. It is true. You can find it like probably where you're listening to it right now. It's probably the normal place where you'll be listening to it. But in case you don't know, and like maybe it's playing through the speakers at the diner you're at or something, you're like, oh my God, this podcast is amazing. I need more of that. You can find us on Spotify, iTunes, iHeart, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Music, and like a whole bunch of other places that, you know, we didn't list because I'm getting tired of reading. But apparently Denny's. Denny's. It's available at Denny's. Some Denny's may not be a participating member of the Promoter 101 podcast now. <laughs> hey, we're just days away from Philadelphia, PA. Here we come. Catch us on campus this Wednesday, January 30th, 2019 at the University of the Arts at Kaplan Recital Hall, featuring special guest Live Nation's Jeff Gordon for our live show recording in Philly. We've just confirmed a very special, special war story with one of the best booking agents in the biz. It's going to be a surprise for all of you who we got, but it's a great story about crossing the borders. Plus, admission is totally free. Brought to you by our friends at the University of Arts. Doors open at 6.30. Show starts at 7. And we're making sure that we're going to warm it up nice and warm for everybody because we know it's cold as shit with that cold snap in the middle of the country right now. Holy shit, is it cold. Every time in January, we'll never fucking learn. Don't go to the Midwest. What am I thinking? So anyway, we'll see you this week, Thursday night, 7 o'clock. The show will go on. And then afterwards, the shenanigans will fly. And for you students, be ready to have your questions ready to zing Jeff Gordon. Whoever has the best questions. I'll, I guess I'll buy you a drink at the bar afterwards, I guess. I don't know. I wasn't prepared to have a prize ready, but hey, we'll figure it out. Anyway, this Thursday, we'll be in Philly, PA. It's going to be, you know, cold. If you do the social media thing, you're more than welcome to follow us on Twitter. I'm Ant Taylor. Dan's at the Jew. Luke, who's normally here, is at W. Luke Pierce. And the show is at Promoters 101. That's Promoters with an F. Or it's just Promoter 101 because we got them both now thanks to the awesome legal help of AEG. Look at you. Yeah, we hooked that shit up. If you got something on your mind and you want to share it with us, you can just email us at Steiny at Promoter101.net. That email is up and running nonstop, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, just for you. Our hotlines are open and operators are standing by. Hi, I'm Leslie Olenek from Live Nation Touring, and I'm on Promoter 101. Well, there's no better way to name drop a ton of people than announce the birthdays for the week of January 29th through February 4th, 2019. That's right. January 29th, Danny Glazer, Ray Sully, and Chris Ward. Wednesday, January 30th, Joe Escalante, Scott Sokol, Claire Tully, and Randy Olson. Thursday, 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 the 31st of January, Jesse Stoll, Eric Bresler, Brian Jonas, Brian Dresky, and Andrew Buck. Friday, February 1st, Tommy Merrill and Eric Hoffman. Saturday, 2-2, Gene Fellings, Joe Anderson, and Eric Selt. Sunday, February 3rd, Patrick Corcoran, John Oaks, 
and our very own Jason Zink, a.k.a. Uncle Pickles, to the people that know him best. Monday the 4th, Joe Wooden and Mike Fry. Happy birthday from the Promoter 101 gang. People walk down the alleys and they bump into the Promoter 101 gang and they're like, yeah, no, this is not going to be a problem. <laughs> Getting rolled by your average high school soccer team everywhere. Those kids have cardio. They work out. We go to conferences. We lift pints, but we do it for hours. <laughs> hours, I tell you. Hi, this is Bruce Solar from APA. I'm about to tell you some very, very secret stuff on Promoter 101. Up next, a war story with legendary runner Aaron Falls. We've got Aaron Falls and we're talking about war stories. You got one for us, buddy? I do, my friend. You know, runners are like the infantry version of the mailroom, right? You know, and the thing is, you do it long enough, nothing surprises you at some point. The one that sticks out for me was when I was asked to take the Stone Temple Pilots bass fishing in Lowell, Massachusetts. They were playing at the Saunders Arena in Lowell, Mass, and this was like 2000. Disturbed, I think, was the Support Act. It's October in New England, and it goes one of two ways. It's sunny and there's great foliage, or it's just hellish weather. There's a nor'easter blowing in. It's cold, it's rainy, it's windy. That was what this day was. You know, I roll into the arena, I'm coming out of cater, and this girl comes up to me and says, hey, do you know where there's a sporting goods store nearby? And I was like, well, not really, but I'll figure it out. I hadn't done a whole bunch of shows up in the Lowell area. What do you need? Well, one of the guys in the band wants to go fishing. Can you just talk to the guy? I'm like, yeah, sure. Just around the corner walks Robert DeLeo, bass player. And he says, hey, man, are you going to be the one that's going to go and get the gear? And I said, yeah. I said, what do you need, bro? And he starts to explain to me exactly what he wants not knowing that like I've been fishing since I could hold a fishing rod. I mean, it's one of my favorite things to do. I stopped him after a while and said, look, dude, what are you going to do? You're gonna spinning tackle, bait casting. You're going to do ultralight line, six pound test, eight pound. What do you want? But he had this look of like relief and exhilaration on his face. He's like, oh, dude, like, can I go with you? I work for you, man. Whatever you want to do. I said, but I got to let you know, man. That Lowell River, I don't know if you want to fish in there, if there's anything in there. You know, it's October, bro, and it's kind of nasty outside. And it's like, no, nah, you know, I don't, I, it's just about fishing. I just like casting. I just want to, I don't care if I catch anything else. We take off down the road, it's like a half an hour. So when we get to this sporting goods store, it's just me and him and the guy behind the counter I'm just buying all this gear, two of everything, because one of the other guys might go fishing too. We get back to the arena. I meet him outside. It's horrible weather. He comes out, big smile on his face. I'm like, yo, did you say one of your other buddies is coming or what's up? He's like, oh, yeah, he'll be here in a second. And just at that moment, around the corner with his assistant comes Scott Weiland, who is dressed in a textbook yellow rain slicker. And he looked like a cross between like, you know, E.T. and the Gordon's Fisherman. But it was just surreal, funny. That's an image. And eventually Scott got tired of the weather. I don't blame him. He took off and he turned around. He's like, hey, do you want to fish for a while? Like, I'm just going to head in. I was like, you know what? As a matter of fact, I think I do. And uh, Rob's like, see, man, I knew you weren't going to leave me hanging. So we start fishing. Immediately, I get hung up, snagging. I leave, go to another spot. Rob goes to my spot. And he just starts whaling fish, catching fish left and right, just killing it, right? And so eventually, about 45 minutes later, I get tired of the weather. I'm like, dude, I'm going to go in. I should probably actually get back to work. He's like, oh, it's all good, man. Thanks for hanging out with me. I really appreciate it. So he's standing there in the rain, doing his thing. Cut to nine hours later, showtime. House lights have gone down. Intro music has started. And I happen to turn the corner in the hallway when the band's making their walk to the stage. Now they're in full armor. And at this point, Robert sees me. And he stopped and he's like, Aaron, you shouldn't have left that spot, dude. As soon as you left, I went right over there. Dude, I must have pulled a two pound smallmouth bass out of there. As soon as you left, there's no way you did. No, you did. No, I swear to God, dude, it was at least 15, 16 inches. But keep in mind, the intro music has started. There's like 8,000 people going ape shit. The rest of the band is on stage. And we are now lost in this conversation to the point where Charlie Hernandez, production manager, goes, Rob, you got to go now. <laughs> he takes off right into the first song and off he went. It was just the most ridiculous time to have a debate about a fish story and what he did or didn't catch, you know, as the show has already begun. I'll, I'll never forget it as long as I live. Well, God knows I have had so many shows get in the way of my fishing stories. <laughs> <laughs> Although I must admit, I think the best stories that come up and the most screwing around and the most fun are the little secrets told in the wings while the act is changing gear or doing a quick change or grabbing a drink while you're standing there. That's the best shit. 
Absolutely the last conversation I thought I would have. And I think the moral of the story is just because they're arena rockers selling out everywhere and they're the best place to get wine in the south of Spain, they may also know the best lures to use in your neck of the woods. Since you brought up the wine story, I would like to share a story with you, if I may, just really quickly. Uh, Please. I had moved to Eugene and I was going to school and I was doing shows at the McDonald Theater when it opened up. And I was dating this young woman who had now become my wife, but we were still in the date process as she was in the grad program at Oregon. It was going to be our first Valentine's Day together, living together. She was very excited. We were going to do up Valentine's Day. It was going to be big. I was going to get to deliver real romance. And we'd been talking about it for a while. I had that moment of like, I get to be romantic. And she comes home from work and catches the announcement that the Valentine's Day massacre presented by Dan Steinberg at the McDonald Theater was Slayer is coming to town. (laughs) She caught the commercial before I had a chance to break it to her. She was pretty cool about it. She's like, hey, if this show does what it sounds like in the radio, it's going to do. You're going to be able to afford a lot of Valentine's Day dinner. So it's cool. I'll go to Slayer with you. The show sells out, right? And what a great show for Valentine's Day. The Valentine's Day massacre with Slayer. So I'm talking to Carrie in the wings and I had mentioned to him, you know, this is my first Valentine's Day with my girl and she's here and she's being a good sport. And he's like, you know what? I brought some back some amazing wine from Australia. Let's break open a bottle after the show and let's see if we can't uh, put the romance back in your relationship because I don't think the Slayer show is going to do it. I learned that night never to judge a book by a cover because Carrie saved my romance on my first Valentine's Day with Elodie backstage at the Valentine's Day Massacre. You never, never, never question that Slayer's got better taste in wine than you do because they just might. Hey, Carrie King, Hall of Fame wingman right there. Well, Aaron, I can't thank you enough for sharing your story and letting me get mine out, which, you know, is a rarity. I don't actually do that too often on the podcast. It was my pleasure, man. That's a great one. But you triggered a memory in me. So, hey, there it is. Our war story with Aaron. Thanks so much for being here, man, on Promoter 101. Hoop. Thanks, Tony. Aaron represents many of the people in the business that actually make the production happen on day of the show on the road. On the ins and outs, man, we salute all of you guys for the actual hard work you guys do while we're at our desks in our warm, comfy office chairs and bitching about the number of shows we have to do while you guys are actually loading in and out shows. You guys make this industry work. Amen. This is Andrea Johnson from ICM Partners, and you're listening to Promoter 101. Did you think we'd really forget to announce the Promoter 101 Badass of the Week? No, I didn't, because it's in the script and it's up next. This week's Badass of the Week is from Vectors Management's Ross Shillings. From Aaron Lewis to Skinner, he is just killing it right now, making him this week's Promoter 101 Badass of the Week. Well done, Ross. Patty Ann Tarleton. I'm uh, overseeing Canada for Ticketmaster today, and I'm on Promoter 101. In our feature interview this week, we got UTA's Jeremy Holgerson talking g easy to the Pogues. We are in New York City, and I'm hanging out with Jeremy Holgerson. Welcome to the podcast. Hello, hello. Our careers have been intertwined for almost 25 years now. And over the years, you've always had great ears. I'm like, slightly stupid. You know we before pretty much the world that they, they had something special. Yeah, no, that was one of the first acts I worked with when I was an assistant. I, luckily, who I worked with was allowing me to uh, kind of take on an act to uh, just mess around with. And I was always a fan of Sublime and the Skunk Record stuff. And they seemed to be the heir apparent to the throne at that point before Long Beach Dub All-Stars. And I was just excited to work with them and get the chance to do it. You were an assistant at the agency group, right? Artist and audience, and then the agency group. Started out at Artist and Audience, which was a little boutique agency. I don't know if you remember Alex Cochin, who was an agent. I think he'd left ICM and started with Guns N' Roses and Nine Inch Nails, Paul McCartney, uh, Marilyn Manson. It was a great place to start. I was an intern and I lucked out and just kind of happened to be there when okay, like Jonathan Levine was there, Jonathan right? Jonathan Levine was there. Brad Navin was his assistant, who now runs the Orchard. Uh, Randy Nichols was there. Tim Bohr, Nat Farnham, Sam Kirby was there. Uh, yeah, I, I started out as Sam roster. and Ken's assistant. I was an intern. Ken and Sam had happened to be like that point where they were ready to share an assistant, and I was there and uh, lucked out. I remember buying legendary pink dots and typo negative from yeah. Ken and Tim in those days individually. But yeah, 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 and Jonathan Levine was there. Jerry Gerard, Adam Schneider came in, who you know he was Perry Farrell's guy and so started the Enid Festival. One agency. And, yeah, it was great. And there was even interns there that went on to do great things. Like Art Dimstein was an intern there. So were you promoted to agent there or were you still assistant? I was Ken's assistant and then John Levine had left like a year 
before maybe. And then Ken decided he wanted to leave. He went over to the agency group and I asked me to go with him and I went over there with him. And that was when it was the New York office. It was Steve Martin, Dave Kirby. Peter Schwartz. Peter Schwartz and Ken. That was the whole New York office. And the Toronto office was just Jack Ross, Ralph James and Colin and maybe one or two Colin other people. Lewis. Yeah. So when you went to TAG, did you immediately get promoted to junior agent or agent or were you still no, in the system? I probably became an agent in 2001 or so when I started like kind of building my roster and they were kind of like, all right, here's a phone, here's a desk, go build a roster. Okay. So you're talking about Ken from English being a pretty thorough agent to learn from. He's a very detail-oriented guy. And at the time, Creed's agent, some of the biggest bands in the world. Uh, yeah. When he left Arsenal, it was Creed, Bloodhound Gang, Goldfinger, and Real Big Fish. I forgot about Bloodhound yeah, Gang. Yeah, Bloodhound Gang, yeah. All right. So agency group, you get promoted to agent. Who are some of the first acts you get to work with as an agent? couple that I'd worked on is Ken's assistant, like Edna's Goldfish. I think Blue Rodeo, he let me work on Finger 11. And then some of the first acts I started booking and signed myself were you know, Hatebreed, Glassjaw, Shadows Fall, Dynamite Hack. If you remember Dynamite Hack, they were a uh, farm club. Their first doors, they were kind of like a Weezer, Jawbreaker kind of band. We did a bunch of Hatebreed dates together. I remember that. Yeah, a lot of Hatebreed shows. I remember them playing the Mercury Cafe and Mercury every little Cafe, yep, yep. Stink Pit. Still lawsuits from Hatebreed shows back in the day going on. They were always exciting. Always phone calls after. Always an interesting crowd. I love Jamie. He was an entrepreneur. You know, he'd get off stage and he'd set up the record store and he'd yeah, sell records. And he was, yeah, he had everything going. He was great. Later became VJ on MTV uh -huh. and uh -huh. always had just 17 things going on at once. Jamie was always fun to hang out with. Yeah, that was just my roster. I and slightly stupid and have Soul Brain. So I worked with Stealth, which was Daryl from the Bad Brains, was another one that I was allowed to work on as an assistant to kind of just sharpen my teeth on. And eventually, you know, Soul Brains, which was became Bad Brains, was able to work with. So you have found some real success over the last, what, five or six years or so moving into the hip hop genre. As you've always been alternative punk and rock, but this new moment for you finding arena success in the hip hop genre, it's like seemingly to jump genres is a little unheard of in this business, but you took a risk and it paid off big. Yeah. I mean, I've always liked all different styles of music. And sometimes when you start signing acts, it's not completely based on what your personal tastes are because someone else might have a lockdown on that genre or might have the bigger acts in that genre. And I've always developed relationships and worked with what I like working with, you know, whether no matter what the musical genre and if it excites me. And I How think, did that door know, open itself up to you? Watching Peter Schwartz, you know, with Wiz Khalifa and having success with Mac Miller and seeing hip hop become more viable again on a touring front, because when you think about it, rock was always the predominant touring ticket seller for the most part. Hip hop has always had acts that sell, but not like it is now, like okay. where you could have five to 20 hip hop headline tours going out in 500 cap clubs to arenas and they're all selling tickets. And there was a shift like probably 10 years ago where I think kids just, you know, hip hop became exciting to kids and a lot of the kids in the burbs and wherever and kids were buying tickets, you know, were coming out, you know, and buying advance tickets for acts like Wiz and, you know, ASAP Rocky came along in that whole wave of uh, hip hop. And I think that then became the new norm. Historically, when you and me got into the business over the course of the last two and a half, three decades, hip hop went from being something you couldn't ensure that didn't tour well, that were spot dates for the most part, to learning how to tour like rock acts. And with bands like Atmosphere and Ice Cube doing serious volume and Wu-Tang picking up bus tours and like doing it, I think we've seen And I mean, change. Atmosphere is probably one of the few, you know, acts that did go out there and tour clubs Ball consistently. Yeah. yeah. But it was one of not many out there in between a million rock tours. Any spring right, there's or fall always, or like, If you wanted to talk about bringing a hip hop show to town, the first conversation was rooms and flights, which costs more than the show is going to gross in a lot of cases. So it really needs to be a bus tour. But these acts have learned how to tour, but it was something by volume that rock acts have always been considered more professional and it's simply because they just done more volume and have killed it over time but hip-hop has really developed in something where they've learned how to tour with buses and turned into professional acts and production i mean hip-hop's kind of the new rock on a lot of levels you know the hip-hop acts are more like rock stars than rock stars yeah the production has seriously increased with the video and the lighting and the projection and acts are smart i mean i, I remember even g easy early on when he was like playing the studio webster hall would spring for lights and extra things to you know, make a show, even on a small club level. And I think all hip hop acts now, like, I guess it's nice too, because you don't have a full band, you're not paying for as many crew on the road. So I guess you can put a little more into the production on a lot of levels, but 
you'll see acts and, you know, small club tours with like an LED wall or a screen. And I think it's also part of the experience now that kids expect that and want that because, you know, when you think about Spotify and the internet and how things have changed on the live side, people want to go out and, and see tours and see live music more so than ever before. Let's take a little case study of GEZ. So you're the RA and obviously arena success. You guys are off cycle at the moment, right? Yeah, we just finished the summer tour, the uh, endless summer tour too. Okay, so you're playing arenas and sheds on a tour like that. How, how much production are you rolling with? Eight to 10 trucks, depending. Okay, so budgeting a tour of that scale is something that you don't do in the ballrooms. It's something that takes a lot of teamwork and a lot of budgeting and a lot of understanding. Growing into that, going from an assistant to booking club acts to booking ballroom acts and suddenly booking arena acts, like being in a major agency with guys like Ken around you that have done that for years, that must have been a great resource having all those guys in your office to learn from. Now, you know, David Zedek and Ken, Steve Call, Tim, like always having people around that always had a good experience and you could go ask the questions. And if you didn't know the answer, you could go find it out pretty quick. So you were in business with Lauren Hill before GZ, right? Uh, about the same time. But he hadn't broken yet, and she was obviously already legendary-esque. I mean, he was still a development artist at that moment, right? Because you broke him. Yeah, the first tour, it was Warp Tour. Hip-hop was starting to tour, and there was acts out there touring, but it wasn't like it is now. Last year, how many acts were on the road from, like, 500 cap club tours to arena level in hip-hop? It was, I mean, there was probably the biggest year I think I've ever seen on the touring side of hip-hop being out there. And everything is doing well, which uh, some tours go down, but the amount of acts out there and everyone wants to see it is amazing. So Lauren Hill is probably the modern-day Whitney Houston. She's a legendary artist at this point and has gained such a huge name and status as miseducation just gets bigger and bigger and the Fugees become more legendary as years pass. And the longer it is before they do a reunion, the bigger it gets and the more people want it. Being involved with an icon of that level, picking the right plays, picking the right venues, is that more of a challenge, making sure that you're keeping the brand at the level that it's built to? It's the job we do. I mean, with any artist, you're choosing the right venues and the right plays and right markets and done a lot of festivals with her and picking out the right festivals, jumping back and forth between anything from Camp Flogna to Coachella. You know, she could do it. She's done High Sierra. You know, she could play anything because her, her music obviously is breaks down every barrier. It's got every style of music in there. You could go play jam band festival. You can go play a hip hop festival. You can go play a mainstream festival and it works. You got a very eclectic roster. So was there a thought behind that process on how that happened, or was that just work out that way? I have just always liked different styles of music, and I've also liked to keep my roster diverse because then other, you know, certain genres aren't competing with each other. Like if I had all hip hop acts, there'd probably be some competition or acts maybe not getting an opportunity because another one is, you know, four other similar acts are up for the same opportunity. And I think it just keeps it well balanced. And I remember wanting to change my roster probably 10 years ago where I wanted to basically be talking to Coachella in a year, but also talking to Warp Tour, OzFest, to, you know, have acts on every different kind of festival just for excitement and for diversity. I mean, it's just, it's not fun doing the same thing day after day and talking to the same buyers and doing the something that's mundane. I think it's more exciting to go play different festivals, learn different ways to break acts on different stages and different styles of music and crossing over. I mean, probably common thing with a lot of my roster is that it's different styles of music, but also... You know, I've always wanted acts that don't want to stay in that lane and want to go play Warp Tour, even though you're a hip hop act. Or Action Bronson's been playing a lot of rock festivals this year and he's going over great on those. I think that my philosophy is always, you know, whatever situation you go into and whatever opportunity is there, you want to ask the question of whether you will gain fans and not lose your base. You know, whether you're going to add to your fan base and not take a step back and lose the core fan base that you always want to be there to, you know, that maintains. Your brand is an act when you go out and headline or just exist and sell music. The one thing I've always noticed about your acts is, and I've known you for a long time, so I know that this, this has always been a staple, is your acts are good live. Yeah. Yeah, it starts there, you know. And sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's just the music's great, but you know that they could be great live. Like, you know, how many acts have great music and they're just starting to play live? But you can see it pretty early if it's like, all right, if this band goes out and does 30 dates, I know that, you know, they have it. You can tell if they have that drive and that thing that's going to make them become a great live act. They just got the chemistry. There's nothing worse than when a band breaks a single too early and radio takes it and the band's not ready yet to be a headliner. It could really hurt their career long term. It's like they didn't come up through the ballrooms into the theaters, into the arenas, so they don't know how to handle that big festival or arena stage. They don't have a solid hour and a half set and they, because they've got one great single that is everywhere for the moment. And the fans aren't going to come back a second time because they don't have it live yet. Yet, which had they matured correctly and didn't get so lucky so early, it probably would have benefited them in the long run. Yeah, I mean, that's one great thing about G-Eazy. He was able to never have to skip the step. 
you know, and was always a great live band from the very beginning and had that thing. And then, you know, always every step of the way added the next thing to become the bigger act, but never had to skip a step. You see acts that all of a sudden are playing on a festival and they have like a 20 minute set or something or 25 minute set or they haven't really toured yet. So they don't, you know, have the production or, have, you know, show up with a DJ and no light. You know, it's you got to have that time too to grow and develop into a great live act too. All right, let's get back to Jeezy since you just mentioned it. You guys are at a critical point right now. You're coming off massive successful cycle. To be able to maintain the level that he has had over the last couple of years with the success of that last cycle, he's got to be an amazing amount of pressure on this next album. So taking the time, doing it right and figuring it out, writing that next album and picking the right plays have just got to be a critical amount of decision-making time for you guys. You guys are really in it right now. There's pressure in every cycle for any band. So I think it's just G always goes into the studio and comes out with, you know, amazing songs. He's always releasing music, always collaborating, always working. They've always been smart about taking the right time. You know, if it's okay, we need a couple more months to, to set the record up properly or add another song, they always do it. And, and they're uh, mature like that. They know that about themselves. He, he knows his brand like better than anyone else and what to do. That's you know, refreshing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and a great team around him. His whole team is amazing. A lot of great people talking to him and surrounding him. And it, it's important. Everyone talks about the team, but as you build a team to add the right people along the way, and he's always done that. Some people just use the word team and then just have a bunch of folks around him, but not the right people. And I think it's uh, that's almost as important as uh, you know developing your live act is adding the different key people as you build as an act to add to each piece of what you do. Now, when he's off cycle, is he done or will we, as they're starting to announce festival lineups for the year, will we, will we see him pop up one or two places? A couple of festivals in the spring and then, you know, the plan will be when we know when the record's coming out, you know, probably fall some more top level festivals going into 2020. So that's some when the new albums expected, 2020-ish? Late next year, or like second half of next year, late summer, fall, a couple of festivals in the spring, connectors as we go into the next cycle. Let's talk about you since you've had a very successful career and job security, obviously, at the same place for so long. Any advice for some of the young guys trying to come up? They're trying to get off the assistant desk or trying to become agents, like how to have a long, successful career? I mean, just always look at your business and what you're doing and, you know, reevaluate and ask questions and never sit back and just kick back and say, this is great. Like, I, I always try and challenge myself. That's why, you know, like with new acts and things like that, I always try and maybe pick up something new that I haven't worked with before to figure it out and learn different genre, different style of music, different world. What I did is I always, you know, just listened to everything. You know, I was always the person who would just, you know, be going through the throw out CD bins or the demos and just always trying to listen to new music or look in the computer and just look at different routings and where bands have played and why they played there and just study it all and take it all in. Look at a few, you know, look at people around you that you really respect and admire and kind of watch, take notes, learn. How do you do your research on an act when you first spot somebody live? What are the first things you do to check out an act before you decide that you're going to work with them? Or is it just gut where you see them live and you're like, I got to be involved? Gut, it could be, you know, like a manager, a relationship or someone that where it starts or just hear something and there's something there, something different, you know, every act's different. And then you want to, you know, see who the team is around it, you know, that that's always important. But sometimes it just might be if you believe in the act and you meet the act and sometimes... Certain artists like are just know what they want or could manage themselves, you know, a few acts that do manage themselves and do it, you know, better than anyone else could because they just know their brand and what they want to do better than anyone else. Awesome. And I got to say, of all of the agents I've known through the years, I think you may be the only agent I've never seen lose your temper. You use never an ego conversation or there's never a, no, there's a few, whatever. There's it's, a few. But one I, thing I, I learned from, you know, Nick Harris, who worked with us. Nick the Greek. Nick the Greek. I remember he said once he, because uh, I used to scream a little bit, but um, as, as everyone does, part of our day. Maybe I just got lucky. <laughs> um, but I remember he said he never would raise his voice. He never raised his voice so that when he did or he would just speak firmly so that people knew he was serious because when he would see people lose their voices, that would like almost be like weakness. So it's like it almost people would see that you're losing it or that when you do raise your voice, you know you mean it. Like if you're screaming all day, then how is anyone going to know what really is a fuck up or what's important? Thank you so much for doing the podcast, Jeremy. No problem. Jeremy has built a career by the books, working hard each day and being fair in his deals, building relationships with artists and promoters alike, respected by all. Well on you, Jeremy. Good man. I'm Lucy Dickens from ITB and I'm on Promoter 101. The quote of the week comes to us from Charles R. Swindle. Life is 10% of what happens to you and 90% of how you react to it. That's some deep shit right there. 
I'm Harvey Cohen with Live Nation Canada, and I'm here on Promoter 101. You can write to us by emailing at steiny at promoter101.net. Hey, we'll be back this Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time with Luke W. Pierce at the controls. With SMG's Tim Higgins talking the ins and outs of the arena business. And we got Paradigm Seth Molaski turning the tables on us. Thank you so much, Aunt Taylor, for co-hosting with us. It's so great to have you here. I know you got to run back and run light because like nobody else is going to do it if you're not. Thank you, sir. Great to be here. Until then, we are wishing you sold out shows for the week. Cheers. Call your mother. Call your mother. Jim Glancy Barry presents on Promoter 101.